Okay, we are going to start with uh, a more modern woman, modern in the sense of she's not biblical, uh, and just how I did last time, where I started with Benvenida Abravanel and Dona Gracia Nasi Mendez, uh, and then moved on to Serach Bar Asher, who was our biblical character. Today we're going to do a similar thing. I do want to show you, uh, for those of you who are interested, uh, on the Evite, if you want to go back to it sometime, if you're interested, I did put, and I have it on the screen now to show you, I recorded the last class, the one from January 21st, and there's a link there on YouTube. I also uh, had a packet that I handed out in class last time about uh, Abravanel and Dona Gracia Mendez Nasi. And uh, there also, I have the names of some of the books that I used that I also will be using this time uh, for source materials. Uh, they're written right there. And I also had a packet that I had distributed about Serach Bar Asher, uh, Midrashic materials as well as biblical materials. That I have on a Google Drive as well. And then finally, uh, I attached, uh, included a link to the Jerusalem Post article that Edie had shared with us last time. Edie Seligman was on our class and she had read out loud an, ex an excerpt about this article uh, an article about Serach Bat Asher that's written by Nahama Goldman Barash, or Barish, I think her last name is pronounced. Uh, and it was just recently published, December of 2020. So I have all of those. Uh, I couldn't figure out a way to put it all in the chat here. I can try again. I think it may just be too much to put in the chat, but uh, let me try it one more time. Copy. And let's see if that works. If not, then you can just go on to the Evite uh, at any time. No, it's not, it's not, for some reason, it's not copying and pasting. All right, so let's move on to our women of the day. Uh, so just to put the women of the day, the modern women of the day, modern-ish women of the day, uh, in perspective, last time, Benvenida Bravanel and Beatrice de Luna, who, whose name was changed to Dona Gracia Mendez Nasi, they were from an earlier time period and from a different part of the world than the women we are going to be studying today. Today we'll be studying Gluckel of Hamlin. And last time, uh, the women that we studied, does anyone remember what centuries they lived in? Uh, well, they, they, they weren't that old, so they didn't live through two centuries, but they lived at the turn of the century. Uh, anyone remember either what, 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 time period they lived in or where they lived. You want to type it in the chat or unmute yourself? Elaine's uh, unmuting. No? Spain, Portugal, around the uh, 15th century. Excellent. A plus to Elaine. All right. So yes, it was 15 to 6. Uh, Benvenida Bravanel lived at the turn of the century. She was born in 1473, uh, died in around 1560. She was in Spain and Italy. And then Dona Gracia lived in the 16th century. She was born in 1510. And she lived in Portugal, Belgium, Italy, Turkey. And they were both philanthropists in the Jewish world, uh, both very wealthy women. Uh, now we're going to a woman at a very end of, very other end of the socioeconomic spectrum, uh, Gluckel, uh, or Glickel, how some pronounce her name. Uh, does anyone know where, what country she's from and what century? And the hint is later than the 15th, 16th century and earlier than we are living today. Risa? I just know it's Gluckel of Hamlin. Yes. So do you know what century she lived in or what, like where she lived? Where, where was uh, Isn't that Europe? Some, I believe that's Europe someplace. It is Europe someplace. Uh, Glickel is a Yiddish name. Um, does anyone know what Glickel means? Anne. Anne's got the Yiddish going here. Little luck. A pistol of luck. A pistol of luck. So Glick would be luck. Glickel is like a little, it's a diminutive uh, luck. So it's a diminutive, yeah. Yes. And in some ways, she had luck in her life, one could say, but in many ways, not so much. Uh, and for us, all of us, we are really fortunate. We are really lucky that we have a memoir that she wrote that was passed down from generation to generation. Hamlin was in Germany. And uh, this was 17th, 18th century. And the three main, I should show you, uh, yeah. The, there are three major historical events that took place either right before the birth of Gluckel or during the time of her life that really had an influence on her work, on her memoir. Uh, her, her memoir took place, she was born in 1646. And in 1648, when she was just two years old, that was the end of the 30, day, 30 days, 
how about, uh, 30 years war. So we have historical event number one, 30 years war, historical event number two, the Khmelnytsky massacres, and historical event number three, Shabtai Tzvi. So does anyone, uh, would anyone like to either look it up on Wikipedia or know it in your heads? Just a couple of sentences about each of these historical events and I'll fill in the blanks. So uh, yes, Lisa, go ahead. I oh, know Shabtai Tzvi um, claimed to be the Messiah and there were a whole yeah. lot of people who followed him and believed that he was the Messiah until he was proved false. Yes, so he is, there is a whole movement, Sabbatianism, uh, Shabtai Tzvi was from Turkey, he did proclaim himself to be the Mashiach, and he was not. In fact, he ultimately converted to Islam, so clearly Mashiach's not converting to Islam. Uh, he was given a choice of death or conversion. Uh, he did live in Turkey, and he, which was part of the Ottoman Empire, and so he did convert to Islam. So that took place during Glickel's life. Uh, 16, I, the years that I have for when he first proclaimed himself to be the Messiah, 1648, which is when she was born. Um, she was born, she was two. Uh, and then it, when he converted to Islam, 1666. Okay, anyone know anything about the Khmelnytsky massacres or about the Thirty Years' War? I've heard of them. Uh, Susie, good to see no, you. I was just mumbling that I've heard of them. <laughs> yeah, um, Susie raised her hand. Oh, good. Yeah. I, I just Googled it. So um, the Thirty Years' War took place from 1618 to 1648. Um, in Europe, and it was a bunch of wars by various nations, um, and the reasons were religious, um, dynastic, and territorial, and for commercial reasons also. Um, they estimated that there was four and a half to eight million died, mostly from disease and starvation, and in some areas of Germany, they suggest over 60% of the population died. Thanks, Susie. Anyone else want to add anything to the Thirty Years' War and how it, uh, where it, where it actually took place? Okay, so let me just add a couple of uh, snippets about this. So it actually started out. Most historians agree that it started out as a religious war and then ultimately became more of a political war. And it started in 1618 when the future emperor of the Holy Roman Empire. Uh, he was also serving as king of Bohemia, Germany, er, including Germany, and he attempt, attempted to impose Roman Catholicism uh, in an absolute way, in an absolutist way on all of his domains. And there were Protestants, nobles in Bohemia and Austria and elsewhere who rebelled against this. So there was a war be among, be between Catholic and Protestant states that were part of the Holy Roman Empire. And it eventually became less about religion and more about which group would ultimately govern Europe. So that was the world that uh, Glickel was born into. Uh, in this book, uh, Written Out of History, Our Jewish Foremothers by Sandra Henry and Emily Tate, there is, uh, it says here, in 1646, while the Thirty Years' War was winding to a close, a baby girl was born to pious Jewish parents in Hamburg, Germany. She was called Glickel, which, as Anne pointed out, means luck in the Judeo-German dialect. Her life spans 70 years and almost a century of events that have all been documented by historians as well as by Glickel herself. When the Thirty Years' War finally ended, the German cities, in the same state of political disorganization as before, were gasping for breath. The German population had suffered from the plague as well as from the war and its aftermath. There were riots, killings, religious persecutions, and disease, disease that had resulted in a general breakdown of the economic system, trade, and travel. Basically, the long drawn out battle had solved very little, and the middle European countries, including Germany, were still divided among feuding factions of Catholics and Protestants, uh, the Protestants in particular, the Lutherans and the Calvinists. And the Jews were still very much the outsiders many of them secluded in ghettos and forced to pay high taxes to the individual noblemen in whatever city they attempted to live. Trade and small business were the main mainstay of the Jewish community in the German and Middle European towns, including where Glicko lived. So that, that's where the Thirty Years' War sheds some light and gives us a stage for the life of Glicko. In addition to that, as I mentioned, the Khmelnytsky massacres 
Uh, and did anyone want to say something about the Khmelnytsky massacres? Clearly the word massacre is not a good word. Uh, Alice, do you want to unmute yourself and let us know? Okay. Uh, was that the, uh, the big uh, pogrom in Russia? Um, you're, you're, I've never heard the, um, the name of the town pronounced before because it's, it's uh, a bunch of consonants with uh, one vowel. <laughs> No, as Russian uh, is, um, but that, that's the CH. Is that how you start? Sometimes it's pronounced, uh, first of all, Kmelnitsky, it was the name of a person, not a place, and still unpronounceable. Um, Kmelnitsky sometimes is, is spelled with a CH, sometimes a KH. I've seen it K H M E L N Y T S K Y, sometimes with an I at the end, you know, all kind of combinations. And yes, it's uh, difficult to pronounce. Um, and you may not have heard of the, or remember or know any details about the Kmelnitsky uprising, but um, you may have heard of, probably heard of the Cossacks. And it took place between 1648 and 1657, the Cossack Rebellion. Uh, it took place in the Eastern part of Poland. Uh, and I guess at that point also Lithuania, Pol the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth. And uh, the commander of the Cossacks, his last name was Kmelnitsky. Okay. And um, they were basically fighting against Polish domination and against Commonwealth forces. And this affected the Jews actually, and also Roman Catholics because there were some mass atrocities, riots, uh, pillaging, raping against the civilian population, especially against Roman Catholic clergy and the Jews. Uh, the Jews in particular, because they represented, at least to those who were uprising, the peasants, the Ukrainian peasants, they looked at the Jews as the upper class, the owners, the uh, oppressors in modern terminology. And uh, so you can imagine that when Glickel was alive, that this affected her part of the world as well. Uh, she lived in Germany, which, as we know, very close to Poland. So that gives us a little bit of a historical background. We, uh, we heard about the in reverse chronological order, the Shabtai Tzvi, Messiah craze, uh, and the failed messianism movement, uh, the Kmelnitsky massacres, and the Thirty Years' War. So now let's hear a little bit about Glickel. Okay, Glickel, I'm going to share the screen for this piece. Okay, so um, her full name in Yiddish Hebrew was Glickel, but Rabbi Yehuda Leib Hamel, Hamel, the name of the place. Uh, many times Jews, Jewish men were referred to as Rav or Rabbi on tombstones and in names, but didn't necessarily mean that they were ordained rabbis. It was just a term of respect. Rabbi just means teacher anyway. So you might see if you go to a cemetery and you'll see on some tombstones, it'll say so-and-so, the daughter of, or so-and-so, the son of, Reb, and then a name of someone doesn't necessarily mean the father was a rabbi. You may know this from Fiddler on the Roof. Tevya often referred to himself and others referred to him as Reb Tevya. Okay, so I have some things from Wikipedia but uh, that I'll, I'll share with you and I'll put that on the Evite and you're welcome to copy and paste these. But um, in addition, there is a really nice article about Glickel in the Jewish Women's Archive. So we're going to read parts of this out loud. Uh, so raise your hand if you would like to read this first part. I'm only seeing six at a time, so let me scroll through, see if anyone's hand is raised and whose vision is good enough to read it. Okay, Phyllis, and then Myrna will go next, but first Phyllis. I'm going to unmute. Okay. <clears throat> Glickel, author of an untitled memoir in Yiddish that is the source of most of the information, <clears throat> excuse me, about her life, with the exception of the date of her death and several minor details. Was born in Hamburg to an affluent family of merchants with commercial and familial ties to the court, Jews and their surrounding circles. When she was 12 years old, her parents betrothed her to Hyman Hamel, whom she married at the age of 14, moving into his parents' home in Hamel. After their first year of marriage, the couple lived with Glickel's parents in Hamburg, where their first daughter was born shortly before they moved to their own home. In the course of 30 years of marriage, Glickel gave birth to 14 children, two of whom 
a two week old infant and a daughter at age three died. Okay. Throughout the stop, years. Stop for a moment. You have to stop because I took it off the screen unless you remember. <laughs> right. <laughs> uh, so I wanted to read for you an excerpt from Glickel's memoir. Uh, this is translated into English, obviously. Before I was 12 years old, I was betrothed, and the betrothal lasted two years. My wedding was celebrated in Hamlin. My parents, accompanied by a party of 20 people, drove there with me. In the evening, we had a great feast. My parents-in-law were good. I'm thinking parents-in-law. She probably wrote Machatenas does. Probably how was it written. My parents-in-law were good, honest people. And my father-in-law, Reb Joseph of blessed memory, had few to equal him. At the feast, he toasted my mother with a large glass of wine. After my wedding, my parents returned home and left me, a child not yet 14, in a strange town among strangers. I was not unhappy, but even had much joy because my parents-in-law um, were respectable, devout people and looked after me better than I deserved. So that makes its appearance in Glickel's memoir. No, she did not write that when she was 14. She wrote that when she was already you know, much older, probably in her 30s, 40s, uh, but she looks back at that time. Uh, I'm going to show you, uh, I have to get off my virtual background or else you won't be able to see. I'm getting a little okay, virtual background, unable to change. Okay, so I won't be showing you because I don't think, I, I have a picture here of uh, the life of Glickle of Hamlin. With, oh, here we go. This was taking a while. Okay. All right, so this photo, it's a theatrical reenactment of the memoir of Glickle. And the woman in the center is dressed in the garb of the time. And along the sides, those are paper puppets. And the paper puppets were depicted. That was how, in this particular play, they depicted the children. Uh, as I said, she had 14 children. Uh, two of them died. Another thing I wanted to read to you, and this is from this book, written out of history. This is an excerpt of the memoir in which Glickel talks about the death of, well, she talks about many things in this context, but she touches upon shop type C, and she also talks about the death of her daughter, her, the, the three-year-old daughter. So I'm gonna to read to you, partly it's her memoir and partly it's comments by Sandra Henry and Emily Tate. So first comments. Glickel was a married woman and a mother many times over when Shabtai Tzvi, the self-proclaimed Messiah of the Jews, gained popularity in Europe. Glickel described the impact of this messianic movement on her community and the results of Shabtai Tzvi's downfall in her own very female metaphor. She compared the Jews of Europe to a woman who is in labor. After the final stages of labor are completed, the child is not born. It was all for nothing. It was just about this time that Glickel herself bore another child, a daughter, Maddie, who in her third year became ill and died. Perhaps associating the two events in her mind helped to create such a vivid comparison. So now I'm going to read from the memoir itself. During this time, I was brought to bed with my daughter, Maddie. She was a beautiful child. And also about this time, people began to talk of Shabtai Tzvi. But woe unto us, for we have sinned, for we did not live to see that which we had heard and hoped to see. When I remember the penance done by young and old, it is indescribable, though it is well enough known in the whole world. O Lord of the universe, at that time we hope that you, O merciful God, would have mercy on your people Israel and redeem us from our exile. We were like a woman in labor a woman on the labor stool who after great labor and sore pains expects to rejoice in the birth of a child, but finds it is nothing but wind. This, my great God and King, happened to us. All your servants and children did much penance, recited many prayers, gave away much in tzedakah throughout the world. For two or three years, your people Israel sat on the labor stool, but nothing came save wind. We did not merit to see the longed for child, but we were left neither here nor there in the middle. 
The joy when letters arrived telling about Shabtai Tzvi is not to be described. Most of the letters were received by the Portuguese Jews. They took them to their synagogue and read them out loud there. The Germans, young and old, went into the Portuguese synagogue to hear them. The young Portuguese on these occasions all wore their best clothes and each tied a broad green silk ribbon round his waist. This was Shabtai Tzvi's color. So all went with joy to hear the letters read. Many people sold home, hearth, and everything they possessed, awaiting Geula, redemption. Okay, let's read some more about Klickel's biography. You've heard a couple of excerpts from the memoir. I'm going to go back to the share screen. And would someone else like to read? I think Myrna had volunteered to read after Phyllis. So right here, this paragraph here. Uh, Myrna, you need to unmute. Yes. Throughout the years, Glerkel was also an active partner in her husband's business, which consisted mainly of trading in jewelry and precious stones and to a lesser degree, money lending and financial transactions. Not only was she frequently asked for her advice and opinion, but she herself interviewed agents, considered potential business partners, drew up partnership agreements, kept books, and was at the same time busy bearing, raising, and educating her children looking for suitable matches and dowries for those that reach the proper age and supervising a large and wealthy household. She appears to have been an active and equal partner in all decisions concerning both family affairs and business matters. As a result, when her husband was asked on his deathbed whether he wished to leave any final advice, he replied, I have no instructions. My wife, she knows everything. Let her do as she has done until now. Doesn't that sound like everyone's husband you ever met? <laughs> Wonderful. <laughs> yeah. Okay, keep going, Myrna. Following her husband's death in 1689, with eight of her children still unmarried and living at home, Glerkel continued single-handedly to manage the family's business affairs in Hamburg, where she also opened a sock factory and at the trade fair she attended in other cities. After 11 years of widowhood, during which she rejected many offers of marriage, the scroll up. And after marrying off, oh, and let's see, after marrying off all of her children except for her youngest daughter, Glerkel married a banker, Carl Hertz Levy of Metz, and moved to Metz. Okay, so she's still in Germany. She stays in Germany. Uh, she has experienced a lot in her life. You know, not only were these big historical events going on, but she was a young widow. And I want to read with you another, read for you another excerpt from the memoir in which she talks about mourning for her first husband. Uh, her first husband, she really viewed and considered the love of her life. Uh, the second husband, I, we think she loved him. It sounds like she did, but there, there isn't as much emotion conveyed uh, in her descriptions of her second husband as her first husband. So this is what she writes. What shall I write, my dear Kinda, my dear children, of our great loss, to lose such a husband? I, who had been held so precious by him, was left with eight orphan children, of whom my daughter Esther was a bride. I shall have to mourn my best friend all the days of my life. The whole community mourned and lamented him. The unexpected blow had fallen so suddenly. Surrounded by my children, I sat Shiva the seven days of mourning, a pitiful sight. I and my 12 children thus seated, all our friends and acquaintances, men and women, came every day of the week of Shiva to console us. My children, brothers, sisters, and friends comforted me as well as they could, but each one went home with a loved one while I remained in my house in sorrow with my orphans. My dear mother, sisters, and brothers comforted me, but their comfort only increased my sorrow and poured more oil on the fire. These comfortings lasted two or three weeks. After that, it was as if no one knew me. All right, so that's that a lot of very- Rabbi, sorry. I have a question. Yes. About this, uh, her children being orphans. I mean, after all, they had a mother. Why would it be considered that they were orphans? They only lost one parent. Yeah, I think in our modern terminology, we would not use the, the word orphans for people who have one parent still alive. 
I think if other people had referred to them as orphans, it would have been real objectionable or like there'd be reason to object even more so. But Glickel herself was was referring to them as orphans, either because she was so modest that she didn't think that her kids were having the full parent experience with just her, although she did sound like Superwoman in many ways. Uh, but uh, perhaps uh, and more likely or in addition to that reason, she women in those days really did depend on their husbands for for their finances so even though she was managing the finances uh, she still did have to take care of the kids she wasn't working full time so to speak uh, to use our modern language and she probably really did need some she needed another she needed income it wasn't enough for her to be running the business and as it turned out with her husband now we have a spoiler alert things did not work out so well with her second husband when on the financial front and perhaps when she wrote this maybe she was already thinking i what if i end up in a situation where i remarry where i either don't remarry or i remarry someone and we're not as fine he's not as financially successful but you do raise a really good point phyllis anyone else have comments about that before we read on about her biography Okay, I'm going to put back on Glickel. Okay, speaking of the financial status of her second husband, and actually, uh, Phyllis, do you want to read this? Yes, uh, the financial status of her second husband, to whom she had entrusted all of her money and even her daughter's dowry, gradually deteriorated to the point of bankruptcy. And when he died in 1711, Glickel was left penniless. She was forced to spend her final years dependent on her daughter and son-in-law in Metz and living under their roof, a situation that she had always feared and worked throughout her life to avoid. Oh, okay, so let's keep going. Somebody else like to read? about the Because now we're going to talk a little bit more about the history of the memoir in addition to her life. Anne? Glickel began, began writing her memoirs in 1691 at the age of 46, about two years after the death of her first husband, in order to stifle and banish the melancholic thoughts which came to her during many sleepless nights and convey to her children and their descendants the life stories of their parents and family. We do not know when she decided to compose her book in seven chapters, which she referred to as books, but it was but it was at an early stage that she determined to begin with her birth. However, the first chapter is an introduction to her spiritual world, a kind of manifesto of the faith, belief, belief aspirations, motives, and opinions of this God-fearing pious woman, dealing mainly with these and other topics from the field of Musar, moral and ethical teachings. Keep going. Though the second chapter begins with her birth, there is almost no reference to her childhood and upbringing, save for the fact that she studied in a cheder and that her father saw to it that his children, male and female alike, receive an education in both religious and secular matters. The subject matter of this chapter consists mainly of family occurrences, only rarely witnessed by herself, events in the congregation of Hamburg, Altona, and the figures of her direct ancestors. In dealing with these topics, she often shifts to the past, two or three generations before her birth, touches on the foundation and history of the Kahila into which she was born, and moves from her direct ancestors to other personalities related to them or to their community before she turns nearer to the present for an orderly outline of her husband's family and a concluding statement. My dear children, I write you this in case today or tomorrow your children or grandchildren do not know about their family. I have put it down briefly so that you may know from what kind of people you are descended. Glickel appears as a distinct personality from her own self, with her own self-awareness only following her marriage and even more so with the young families moved to a separate residence of which she speaks at the end of the second chapter. Okay, so I'm going to elaborate a little more on uh, Anne when she was reading the parts that were uh, highlighted in red. Um, I put those red highlights in. Those are actual excerpts from the memoir. I'm just going to just expand upon it a little more. Uh, Gl Glickel writes at the very beginning of her memoir, I have undertaken to write as much as I can remember of my childhood. 
not because I wish to pretend myself as a pious woman or to pretend I am better than I am. No, my sins are too heavy to bear. I am a sinner every day, every hour, every minute, every second, full of sins, and unfortunately I'm shut out from very few sins. Then she quotes from Echa Lamentations, Al Eila Ani Bochia, for these I weep, and mine eyes runneth down with water. I would rejoice to do penance and weep for all my sins, but the anxieties and sorrow for my orphaned children do not let me penance, let me do penance as I should like. So uh, not she's a woman who's very hard on herself. Uh, may sound familiar to uh, many women on this call. Uh, we'll go back now to her. Oh, I did want to read something else. Um, the Memoirs of Gluckel of Hamlin. This is a translation by Marvin Lowenthal. And in addition to having the whole thing translated into English, it also has a very wonderful introduction uh, and, and including some of the historical background. And the author of the introduction is Robert S. Rosen. He writes that when Glickel of Hamlin sat down to write her memoirs in the year 5451, uh, 1690 to 1691, she could not possibly have foreseen that they would comprise one of the most remarkable documents of the second half of the 17th and first quarter of the 18th century, and would in time become an invaluable source for historians, philologists, sociologists, and students of the literature of the period. The writing had been undertaken as a kind of therapy after her husband's death to get her through the long sleepless nights to drive away what she referred to as melancholy thoughts. She addresses herself to her children, assuring them that she is not writing a book of Musar, of morals, but that she would put down everything that had happened to her as far as memory and subject permit. Uh, and that is definitely a sense of what we're getting from these writings. So let's finish up her biography. Anne described the first and second chapters to us. We're going to have a little bit more about the, the third through seventh chapters, not in as much detail. Uh, with someone Rabbi, else. I have a question. Why did she consider herself a sinner? Yeah, that's, I read that and I was thinking, why are all women so hard on themselves? But, you know, the men, I guess, are hard on themselves too. But uh, it just, to me, read like my grandmother, like was always uh, that actually pounding her chest. But like, I always got the sense that she felt she was not good enough. And I think that may have been part of her, just her own self-esteem given how young she was when she got married and also just that may have been the milieu she lived in that religious jews you know the, the word pious was used a lot and she referred to her husband as pious in various places in her memoir i guess part of piety might have meant thinking that you're always in need of doing tshuva that no matter what you're doing there's always more to be doing um, she was constantly striving to do better and it certainly comes across as really self-flagellation maybe an extreme form of it uh, i definitely do not get the sense from reading her memoir that someone who was very um, you know high on herself and had a very high self-confidence but she's just like pretending to be humble i definitely don't get that sense i get the sense she really did feel this uh, would anyone else like to answer elaine's question or make another comment along those lines uh rabbi yes um i noticed that uh, her family sent her to hater and yeah. wasn't that unusual for a a, a girl yes hater yes it was very unusual um and uh i i'm not sure had she not gone to hater would her memoir have been as, I wouldn't say good, because any memoir is good, but it's very, um, there's a lot of source material in here. She quotes, like just in that excerpt I just read to you where she quotes from Echa, and yeah, she might have, I don't think she had Safaria in front of her, but, so she couldn't pull it up on a computer screen, but she, she may have had a Tanakh near her, but just the fact that she had a Tanakh near her, even if she didn't know it just off the top of her head, that shows some learning. So not sure what was special about her family and why they planned to do that, maybe why they decided to give her a Jewish education, but thank, thankfully she did have a Jewish education and thanks for us because this, is, this memoir is so amazing, not only because it sheds light on a time period that we don't where we don't have a lot of primary documents but it's also the fact that it's written by a woman we get historical information and real personal information we get a real sense of the internal life of this woman and uh from the part that elaine was just commenting on you know her self-flagellation it, it it may seem objectionable but in uh, one sense it's also it's very inspirational in the sense that you can write a memoir that is a mix of real personal 
feelings on the emotional front and the secular front, but also on a religious front, how she was feeling spiritually. Yeah, Rabbi, do you think that it was because um, she lived in Germany? Were German Jews a bit more enlightened, so to speak, rather than the Jews from Russia and Poland and the, um, um, the Austrian Empire? Do you think that many more Jewish girls who lived in Germany went to Haider? Um, has anybody ever, you know, done anything on that? Um, I'm not so familiar with the time period of other women at the time, because actually we don't have, we don't have any other primary documents by women from this time period, but we do have some information, some secondary sources of about Cheder, and there is a sense that Cheder was available for women as well as for, for girls, as well as for boys. We don't have any school roles or records to be able to say how many were girls and how typical it was. Yeah. I think that what you were describing about the distinction between Germany and other parts of Europe, that certainly was true later on uh, in the, certainly in the pre-Holocaust period. We always think of the German Jews as be being very high society and having more opportunities than Jews in some impoverished communities in Eastern Europe. I'm not sure if that was the case at the time in Hamlin, but there may have been a real distinction about between people who had money and people who didn't. And while she did end up impoverished, while at the beginning of her life, she said she did come from a wealthy family. So it was very possible that was why she went to Cheder, that it was not, it was partly being in Germany, but it was also given the specific <clears throat> family that she had. Um, does anyone else have maybe more information about this period in European history, about women in general that you might wanna share? I just have a question it has yeah. nothing to do with the women, but you, you keep talking about Hamlin. I wonder if that's like the Pied Piper of Hamlin. Is that possible? I think, yeah, it's the same. I think it's the same place. Yeah, I think it is. Yeah. <laughs> and you know, you mentioned about women uh, not having a, a, a Hebrew education. I think I've mentioned this before. My father, who was from Eastern Europe, said girls don't have to go to Hader. And um, that's why I was sent to a Yiddish school where I had, you know, my education was in a Yiddish school, not in a Hebrew school. So that might have been, you know, typical of the time, you know, that the German women were different, the German girls. Yeah, I mean, certainly uh, most when the Enlightenment happened, uh, Germany was the whole German Jewish community became much more secular and more assimilated way before, and in fact, many places in Poland, it, it, enlightenment never really even hit them in that kind of way. So uh, that certainly was true a few hundred years later, and certainly by the time that you were born, right? And there, there may have been, and I think there were those distinctions between German Jews and Jews from Eastern Europe. I do remember that when I lived in San Francisco, uh, there was, I remember meeting a man named Fred Rosenbaum, who was a historian, and he wrote a book called Jews by the Golden Gate. And he talks about how this very city of San Francisco was founded by German Jews, many of whom were either deeply seeped in the classical reform movement, which was very anti-religious. It was the reform movement in which people did not wear, the men did not wear kippot and people didn't look noticeably Jewish in the street. It's not true of the reform movement today necessarily, but then it was it was a very big reaction against the other types of Jews. The Jews were much more high class, had more money. And those were the ones who, the German Jews, those were the ones who founded San Francisco. And then at some point there were Eastern European Jews who wanted to come into San Francisco. Uh, and the German Jews were not too happy with this because their Eastern European brethren spoke Yiddish and they looked, they were noticeably, they looked more Jewish, they sounded more Jewish. And the German Jews of San Francisco actually wanted to purchase a piece of land from the state of California uh, or and or Me Mexico. And that's where they wanted their Eastern European brethren to go. Uh, in Baja, California, uh, the, the Baja Peninsula, they wanted to designate that as that's the place where the Polish Jews should go. But we, the Germans, you know, we'll stay in the in the fancy parts in San Francisco. So that's okay, many years later and in a different part of the world, but maybe the seeds of it were here in, in Germany. Uh, in, in Rabbi, it was also very similar here in New York. Your first Jews and your first synagogue were German Jews. Um, and they did help the European Jews, but they also too wanted to keep them separate. If you, you know, if you go back to the history in New York. Mm -hmm. 
Thank you for sharing that. So that and that's what Glickel is remarkable in so many ways uh, in terms of her own personal life. And she has as many unique aspects of her story. But there are also parts of her story that are indicative or reflective of larger trends, either for women in general or for Europe in general and for certainly Jewish communities in Germany. I think I am, I am, I can't get the word out. I am Potok's book. Yes. Goes in and in the rest of us indicates that very very scenario that Phyllis just mentioned with New York. Yeah, about the women not going to, not being educated, the girls. Yeah, and the, the, the elite German Jews as opposed to those who came from oh. Eastern Europe later. Exactly. And, you know, even within Poland, like those of us who are familiar with kind of the distinction between Litvish and Galiciana, like even within parts of Eastern Europe, you had this divide between a more upper crust group and a, a group that was perceived as lower class. Okay. So southern, the southern eastern part of Poland, the Ukraine, that was you know, considered, uh, sorry, the, the northern eastern part, uh, the Litvish was considered more upper crust. Jews from Warsaw were considered to be more educated and the girls probably were more educated. Certainly the boys were more educated than the children in the south in Poland. Okay, let's continue with this. Um, Alice, did you want to read? Oh, Okay, in the third chapter, Glickel offers a detailed portrait of the servants, agents, and partners in the family business and of various incidents related to them. She moves on from there to a description of a long chain of events, incidents, and episodes she selects from her memories of the period preceding her husband's death, which make up the third and fourth chapters of her work. The fifth chapter is devoted mainly to a metic uh, meticulous account of the illness and death of her husband Chaim, Hamel, and its immediate aftermath, followed by a description of episodes from her further life and her deeds and actions for the sake of the family's livelihood and her children's future. The last two chapters deal with her later years. The sixth was written after Gligel's remarriage and the seventh after she was widowed a second time. They open with her preparations for her second marriage and her move to Metz and register episodes of her life there with, second, with her second husband, his economic ruin, his death, and the events that befell her afterwards. Okay, stop right there. I'm okay. just going to skim because of time. I'm just going to skim through a couple of other things here. So as I have mentioned, her, Glickel's work is far more than a family chronicle. Um, it abounds in descriptions of events that occur <clears> in the Jewish <throat> community. And we have here mentioned shop tights fee. There's also um, highlighted here in blue, uh, a diamond theft that was carried out in Norway by two Jews from Hamburg. She describes that in great detail. Uh, she mentions places and uh, the Jewish communities and also her interactions with people for, as a businesswoman in Berlin, Frankfurt, Hanover, Amsterdam, Copenhagen. Uh, she also mentions events in Poland. It doesn't seem like she ever traveled there, but she does mention that. And um, here she, she offers a sweep, uh, her perspective offers a sweeping glimpse into the life of the period and its people, including a rich gallery of contemporary women. Um, the last point I want to points I wanted to make about the memoir is that the original language of this memoir was what is referred to by scholars as Old Yiddish or Western Yiddish. Some, sometimes it's referred to as Judeo-German. And uh, as it says here, it's particularly rich in Hebrew elements and includes numerous quotations from the Hebrew scriptures, which uh, I think because of her cheder education and the fact that, she, that her parents did provide her with a Jewish education, really enrich this part of her book. Um, let me see what else. Yeah, let's just read these last two paragraphs because it brings it to the personal level. Uh, Alice, do you want to keep reading? Uh, okay. On the one hand, her memoirs offer a multi-perspective uh, portrait of an entire society, uh, daily life and its conduct, customs and practices, family life, women and their role, child child re child rearing and education commercial economic and spiritual life beliefs and opinions relations between jews and non-jews and much more yet at the same time her work introduces us to the writer's own personality to her inner world to the development of her self-awareness 
Her powers of observation allow us to accompany her, accompany her through joy and pain, to see her in times of crisis, conflict, despair, but also at moments of acceptance, fulfillment, and satisfaction, to catch a glimpse, be it of her sense of humor and irony, or of her sheer pleasure at the act of writing. Okay. So that's Glickel. Um, have any of you read parts of her memoir or or maybe even the whole memoir, Myrna? Yeah, so it is, I said, it is available in English and this is a great translation. Uh, this one by, this Memoirs of Glickel of Hamelin translated by Marvin Lowenthal. Uh, and as I said, it has a really nice introduction. It also has some very nice pictures. Uh, there is a picture I wanted to share here. Uh, it's not, there weren't, not a photograph per se, but. I don't want to do that. Wrong screen. Try again. So the only picture that I was able to find uh, online was this, and that's not even her. <laughs> this is uh, Bertha Pappenheim, who was one of her descendants. And she is wearing a 17th century costume in the persona of Glickel, and it's a painting a very realistic looking painting by Leopold Pil Pilachowski. So I don't know if any of you know or have heard of Bertha Pappenheim, but she is a famous person in her own right. Uh, she was uh, sometimes associated with uh, early feminism. Anyone know any, have anyone heard about Bertha Pappenheim, either from Hadassah circles or just your own reading? Okay, so Bertha, she was considered by some historians to be the founder of the Jewish feminist movement in Germany. And in 1904, just right at the beginning of the 20th century, she founded an organization called the League of Jewish Women. And uh, you can read about her. Uh, the other, what really made Bertha Pappenheim famous though, I should say, well, that, that's, that's famous enough. Um, in addition to being a, an Austrian Jewish feminist and some say a social pioneer and the founder of this Jewish Women's Association, she also was known by her pseudonym. It's funny to be known by a pseudonym, but you may have heard of a patient who was referred to by the pseudonym Anna O. Those of you who are psychologists who study psychology at any time in your life, one of uh, Joseph Breuer's best documented patients was Anna O, oh, and she suffered from what he called hysteria. Uh, and that's who Anna O oh was that happens to be Bertha Pappenheim, one in the same. So you got a little bonus, not only learning about Glickel, but a little bit about Bertha Pappenheim as well. Okay, any other comments about Glickel before we move into the past to a wild woman of truly biblical proportions? Yes, Risa. Not really on Glickel, but just um, we had commented on the word orphan, and I looked it up just to see the use of orphan. And while it you can be a double orphan, it is also used many times with just a single parent loss. So it wasn't just a glitch in here. Okay. And it could have been, I don't know, does anyone know the Yiddish word for orphan? Is it something like yatom is in Hebrew? Elaine, you're trying to talk? Okay. Yesema, I think, isn't that the right word? Yeah. So Yesema is a female orphan, right? Because in Hebrew, it's uh, yatoma. Uh, in, uh, for a female, masculine would be yatom. Yatom does, it, it could be for either parent. And I don't, I think in the Torah, when there is a reference to groups that need our help, kind of the uh, underserved populations or populations at risk, ger, yatom, and amana, ger, a convert or a stranger in some other way, a, a resident alien, they uh, sometimes have ger is translated yatom, orphan, and amana, widow. Uh, a lot of charity, tzedakah was supposed to be given to these groups. Not sure if yatom meant just that dad was no longer with us, mom was no longer with us, or both parents. Um, the Yiddish, I'm just looking it up in my English Yiddish thing, uh, is um, Yasima or Yasim. It's, it's, you know, Yiddishized. Yatom is Yatom in Yiddishized. Right. And does it, it doesn't say anything about whether it's for one parent, losing one parent or two parents. Um, a child whose parents are dead. To it. Child. Okay. All right. Oh. Yes. Go ahead, Anne. Yeah. No. Um, it just says, uh, never mind, it, it doesn't really say. 
I'm sorry. No, I mean, you did funny. read that someone whose parents are dead, right? So yes. That, yes. And that's yes. usually how we refer to that. Yeah, um, in any event, I'm certainly, if we think about Glickel herself and her children, there were parts of their lives that may have been very enriched and enriching. And you'd say they were successful in some ways, but there also was a lot of heartache there. And part of that may have been due to money. Part of that may have been due to not have, for Glickel's kids, not having their father around or also having, not only not having their father around, but having their mother who was clearly deeply mourning the loss of her husband. And that certainly would have affected her day-to-day -day life. But you know, she did not crawl into a ball and disappear. She did continue to manage whatever family business there was. She did end up remarrying. Uh, she describes her reason for remarrying as because, for financial reasons, because she wanted to be able to support her quote unquote orphan children. So we, we see a lot of positive and negative uh, in the life, in her life here and in the life of her children. Uh, overall, does anyone have any just general comments about Glickel? Uh, do you think she is someone who is worthy of studying? If we were, if you were to say add to a religious school curriculum or a day school curriculum, do you think that Jewish girls, Jewish boys should learn about Glickel? Is there something about her story that can inspire the next generation or at least inform the next generations? The young generation. Elaine's kind of like, maybe. Ruth, go ahead. Um, Ruth, uh, unmute. I, I think she's valuable because she's so different from what our opinion of women in those days were, especially in that part of the world. So I think it is good to know that there were people like her. There were women like her. Right. And she really is, I mean, I think in many ways, uh, you know, we hear the term Eshet Chayel, and if you actually read through the lines of Eshet Chayel, Proverbs 31, you get a sense of someone who is smart, but certainly wealthy as well. I mean, wealth has a lot to do with it. That's not necessarily the only thing that can make a woman admirable. But I think when she, <clears throat> when she was a businesswoman and a successful businesswoman, when her husband was a successful businessman, that definitely afforded her a lot of privileges. And who knows if she would have been able to live as well as she did and support all those children without having um, that, that business. And we don't, you're right, we don't think of women from that time period in this kind of way. Uh, yes, Anne. Also, it's a time period that I don't think most of us on this even studied about Judaism in that particular time period. We went straight from the matriarchs to the poor people in the shtetl, kind of. Right. And we never really studied the wealth and the um, prosperity that happened in the 16th century and maybe 17th also. Um, of the Jewish um, in some people. circles, yeah, in some circles, yeah. yes, Alice. Okay, um, she was a very complex uh, person, um, but one thing I don't understand: uh, she seemed to have been a very astute businesswoman, and why, with her second marriage, did she turn over all of her assets to her second husband and watch him? Um, plunge into bankruptcy. In I, I don't understand. I don't understand that. I was thinking, I was thinking she, did a, she did a complete U, U turn. What Maybe did he insist on? It. Did you want to say yeah. something? In re in many countries, uh, up until fairly recently, with women's suffrage, um, the woman's assets belonged to the husband. And, and that was the secular law. So she didn't do it voluntarily. That was just the way it was written. Well, but she didn't. But she didn't have to marry somebody um, if she knew that this was what was going to happen to all of her assets. I mean, she had been a widow for a long time, and after a while, you got you kind of get used to being a widow. You know, maybe he married her for her wealth, and he uh... <laughs> pissed it away. We all want to say that. Right? <laughs> it's always okay, Betty Ann. This wasn't a time when they went into personalities in terms of. Um, obedience to a husband. This was a different kind of marriage. You're also dealing with a 14 year old who was betrothed at 12, who by the time she was probably 35 had her 14 children and a dead husband, approximately. And then she went on. So she was relatively young when she married the second husband with all these children. And, and when they said at the first paragraphs that she helped her husband with all these things you don't really know the depth of it 
of how much she actually helped, except that they had apparently a very good relationship. So I think it would be very hard as a comparison to pick up things from this very youthful, uh, obviously energetic person to people getting married now at 30 and then deciding when to have a baby in addition and maybe having children when this woman is her, her half a life, her full lifetime was half our lifetime. Rabbi, how old was she when she married uh, for the second time? You have the dates. Um, I think she she was her her first husband died when she was in her mid forties. I yeah. think 40. she got married to her second husband when she was in her fifties. Yeah, I mean, I thought younger yeah. than that, but but still, she got married at fourteen. Is the point but, I'm but bringing she, out? But and Betty Ann, so comparison to to learn from her. The one thing I am associating with is very orthodox people who do this. They have multitudes of children mm -hmm. and they do all the other things that have to be done in their life in order to keep up everything. And I really didn't hear too much of the, uh, um, not the Judaism, but I didn't hear too much of the religious part of their life. Right. Well, she does. Um, I just I didn't share those parts. She was a very pious woman. Uh, yeah. She didn't refer to herself as pious. She did, and interestingly enough, as much as she was self-flagellating, she did refer to her daughters when she praised them in her memoir, especially when they themselves became mothers. She does refer to religiosity. Um, and when she praises her first husband, she does refer to his piety. So, for example, here uh, towards the end of her book, this is uh, yes, in the last chapter, she writes, um, I cannot tell you the name my daughter had for piety, breeding, and every Jewish virtue. Grieved though she was, and she's referring to her daughter, for the loss of her children, she seldom let it be shown. She was frugal, foresighted, and exact in her housekeeping, but it never failed to do her credit. Every day she had a house rabbi and a Talmud student at her table and meted out honor and respect to rich and poor alike. So I had reason enough to rejoice in her. She was truly an Asha Chayel. So she mentions pieces of religiosity, including <laughs> Torah study, including acts of Gimilu Chasid, and acts of loving kindness. Uh, and she, she clearly lived this religious life. Uh, she does talk about it and she, she commends others who are in her life for living this religious life. But th that this is what I also see from many very religious families. Uh, this is the way of life. Their white, the wives are just as important, but in a completely different way than today. Mm -hmm. And and they do a lot of things that you don't see or are, are unexpected in the way I am living right now in the sphere I I live in. Okay, let me just read you something. This is from a book called The JPS Guide to Jewish Women, between the years 600 BCE and 1900. There's a, a couple of pages on Glyphal. And this is what's written. Glickle remains a widow for many years after the death of her first husband. She only reluctantly agreed to marry again in hopes of gaining a secure old age. Right. Her second husband was a prominent and rich financier from Metz. So perhaps that explains why she entrusted him to her business doings and, and her money, because he proved successful in his in his own career, in his own life, before he married her, who knows what happened. And uh, it says here, although she admits that, that her second husband was kind to her, Glickel apparently never loved him as much as her first husband. And when he lost his own and her money and died bankrupt, she was left both widowed and penniless. Refusing to take charity from others, Glickel lived in hardship for many years until she was persuaded to make her home with her daughter, Esther. Uh, and the last word I wanted to say about Glickel, this is from an article uh, from a website entitled My Jewish Learning, which has uh, some really nice uh, excerpts on all kinds of things Jewish. But this was written in 2013 by Rebecca Miller. And she refers to Glickel, Glickel as an intrepid businesswoman, a passionate wife, and a memoirist. And in the last paragraph of this description of Glickel, she says, she, end, uh, she amassed a tiny fortune and managed to marry off most of her children, but then remarried a man with no business sense who lost all of her money. Yet there is no trace of bitterness in Glickel's memoirs. She is rather a joyful, enterprising survivor filled to the brim with life. 
Even now, 300 years after her death, her life force burns from the pages of her memoir. So I leave you with that thought of Glickle. And you should have had a prenup. <laughs> Second time around, right. Uh, Anne, go ahead. I just Googled her. And so it also says that her diaries are the only known pre-modern Yiddish memoirs written by a woman and that it uh, provides an intimate portrait of German Jewish life in the late 17th to early 18th centuries and have become an important source for historians, philologists, sociologists, literary criti critics, and linguists. So that's what she did. So definitely worthy of study. We met whether or not we want to emulate her life is a, a whole different discussion. And I thank Alice and Elaine and, all, and Betty and all of you who try to give insights into her personal life and whether or not she's a hero or not, or someone we should emulate. I, I thank you for putting it on this, that path. Okay, Risa, you want the last word on this? On that, we shifted Sipara for it, hour number two here. Now just a, a quick little thing, you know, we talked about the period of time that she was in with all these terrible things going on, the 30 year war, the Helnitsky um, riot and um, Shabtai's V, because everything was so terrible, everybody wanted to believe in hope and something coming. Isn't it possible her husband lost his fortune, not because he was such a terrible businessman, but because the period of time that he lived in, things changed and he just, the wheel of fortune just turns against him? That's possible. And, you know, also at that time, the Jews in Germany and, and other parts of Europe as well, they had to pay a tax that had to be renewed. I forget if it was on a monthly basis or a yearly basis, but they had to frequently renew their uh, permission to be able to even live in these cities and they weren't even considered full citizens. So that alone was expensive. So even if he himself was an intrepid businessman, which I'm not sure it sounds like he was, uh, but even if he, he had been business savvy, we're not sure if he would have still had money given what else was going on in, in the world around him historically, particularly economically, how that affected the Jewish community. So yeah, thank you for raising that possibility as well. So we can't answer all questions about her life or about, or and make any generalizations about women who lived in Europe at that time, but at least we have a little snapshot of life. And as Anne pointed out in her Google excerpt, uh, which, what was the uh, citation for that, Anne? The part that you read about how it's the only early mem early modern memoir we have. You did, Anne. Uh, yes, it was. Um, uh, Lickle's diaries are the only known pre-modern Yiddish memoirs written by a woman, and provide an an intimate portrait of German Jewish life in the late 17th to early 18th centuries an important source for historians, etc. So where did you get that from? Where is that? Is that? I just Googled it. It's in Wikipedia. Wikipedia. Okay. All right. I just Googled Glickle of Hamlin, uh, you know, and, and got that. Okay. So I will include, uh, let me see if I can do it now. I can include in the chat what I had cut and pasted from various sources and some summaries that I have about Glickle. Uh, let me find it right here. In a moment. And then we can shift to Tsipora. So if you have a Humash, now would be a good time to download it. Or, or the part that I asked you to download. All right, so let's see if this, sometimes my copy paste works on my chat and sometimes it doesn't, not quite sure why. Here we go. All right, so what I just download, what I just put here, that is, the, that's the information about Glickle, including Wikipedia link and the link to the various different articles that I quoted. Okay, the part, uh, that it, that we are about to study now is Sipora going way back in time, biblical times, and that's what this is. I'll put that in the chat as well. Okay, so anybody have anything they want to tell me about Sipora? What you know about Sipora before we read some of the text directly from the Book of Shemot and from the Book of Bamidbar from Numbers? Phyllis, go ahead. Zipporah was <clears throat> Moses's wife. Yes, Zipporah was Moses's wife. Wife, yes. Okay, and, and that and that should have been my Hebrew name, but I have oh. a Yiddish name. Okay, it was because it stands for bird. 
Right, because Sipora means bird, right? And so does Vegas bird. Vegas bird, actually, definitely. Okay, so this is uh, what I sent you. The link that I sent you <coughs> is taken from a book, a commentary and translation and commentary that put out by the <coughs> Women of Reform Judaism, WRJ, and URJ, the, uh, the, it's the Reform Jewish Press. And the editors are Dr. Tamara Cohen Ashkenazi and Rabbi Andrea L. Weiss. Uh, and it's about Sipara. We don't necessarily have to use this commentary, but I will be pointing out some comments here. So um, I'll start out with this on the screen, even though I don't see too many of your faces. You may want to, and it may be too small. Uh, just background here, um, the book of Exodus, chapter 2. This is Parshat Shmot. This is when we're first introduced to Moshe. And Moshe, uh, his name was, Mo was Moshe, Moses. And it says here in Exodus chapter to verse 10 that bat paro pharaoh's daughter named him moses explaining i drew him out of the water and uh water was a very important feature in moshe's life uh there are some commentators who actually say that this kimin hamayim mishitihu for from the water i drew him out that should have made his name mashui not moshe that Moshe really means someone who draws others out of the water as opposed to someone who is drawn out of the water. But that actually in some ways may have been very prophetic for Bat Paro to name him Moshe because yes, he was drawn out of the water, but he was destined to be the one to draw others out of the water. If we recall Moses leading B'nai Israel out of slavery in Egypt uh, with the Song of the Sea uh, and all of that that was part in Parshat B'Shalach. So Moshe had uh, there are quite a few women in Moshe's life, uh, including the daughter of Pharaoh, who was his adoptive mother. Uh, his biological mother was Yocheved. His sister was Miriam. And I'm going to turn now to this next. It's still chapter two. And the context here at the end of chapter two, before verse 16, is the background is... Wait, I wanted to do this one. Here. I'm still at verse 11, where it says, sometime after that, when Moses had grown up, he went out to his kinsfolk and witnessed their labors. Okay, so the background right here is uh, Moshe's already grown up. He's grown up as the son. He's been raised as Pharaoh's daughter's son, but Pharaoh's son. And he saw an Egyptian beating a Hebrew slave, and he ends up striking down the Egyptian, and then he ends up running away. And then, I'm still in chapter 2, he arrived in the land of Midian and sat down beside a well. Once again, we have a Hebrew, a well is Be'er. Once again, we have water playing this big role in Moshe's life. We had not only him drawn from the water, uh, he was put in the water to save him when he was a baby boy, when there was the whole decree against killing baby boys by Pharaoh. That's uh, Yocheved had put little baby Moses in the ark. So there's that, the Yeor. We have this Be'er. Uh, we have the plagues also. There's some water involved with the plagues. The very first plague is the water turns to blood. And now here he is, um, this is before then, he arrived in the land of Midian and sits down beside a well. So in between his birth, essentially, and near death through water, and the pivotal experience of him leading B'nai Yisrael out of water, is this in-between midlife part of uh, his experience, also with water, a be'er. Now, there are other cases in the Torah of events that happen at a well. And I think I've mentioned this to you before, the term by Robert Alter, known as a type scene. A type scene is a type of story in the Torah that is told many ways, uh, or many different times it appears. There, this is not the only time in the story where we're gonna have a well and someone coming to save the day at the well or someone meeting someone at the well. So you may recall in Parshat Chaye Sarah that Rivka was at the well. You may recall that in Parshat Vayetze that you had Rachel, Rachel, and Jacob, Yaakov at the well. And now we have, we're gonna have one of Yitro's daughters, Zipporah, she's at the well as well uh, with Moshe. So what do all three of these scenes have in common? They all take place at a well and what ultimately happens as a result of this meeting at the well? Lisa? They meet their Beshert. Yeah, right. So Rivka, who does she end up marrying? Um, Isaac. 
Yeah, she marries Isaac. He's not actually at the well, but the matchmaker is there. Avram's uh, servant, Eliezer, is there, and he makes the match between Rivka and Yitzchak. Uh, with Rachel, who does she end up with? Yaakov. Jacob. They actually meet at the well. He falls in love with her at the well, kind of like meeting at a bar uh, <laughs> in pre-COVID days and pre-technology, pre-J-date days. Uh, and here we're going to have Moshe meeting Sipora at the well. And all of these, that's what they have in common, this well type scene. Robert Alter also points out that when you look at type scenes, you're not only supposed to be looking for commonalities, you're supposed to be looking at differences. And one of the major differences he points out between this scene at the well versus the ones with Rebecca and Rachel is that this one, the description is very, very short. Uh, and uh, the others are much more lengthy. Uh, the woman also in this story, you're going to see she's not mentioned. I keep calling her Tsipora because we know that she's Tsipora because later on we're told her name. But at this point in the story, she's just one of the seven daughters. And a ma major, major difference here is what the role of the man is. So let me put this back on. All right, well, somebody read either from the screen or from your own translation, starting from chapter 2, verse 16. And raise your hand if you want to read. And I'm scrolling through to see faces and hands. Okay, Lisa, you're on. Now the priest of Midian had seven daughters. They came to draw water and filled the troughs to water their father's flock. But shepherds came and drove them off. Moses rose to their defense and he watered their flock. When they returned to their father, Reuel, he said, how is it that you have come back so soon today? They answered, an Egyptian rescued us from the shepherds. He even drew water for us and watered our flock. He said to his daughters, where is he then? Why did you leave the Egyptian? Ask him in to break bread. And Moses consented to stay in that household and Ruel gave Moses his daughter Tipora as wife. She bore a son whom he named Gershom for he said, I have been a stranger in a foreign land. Okay, so it's a very, it's a very little short excerpt. Uh, what is Moshe's role here? So let's compare him, say, to the screen, Yitzchak, in the type scene with Rebecca. Well, with Yitzchak, it wasn't Yitzchak at the well, it was Eliezer. Yeah, Yitzchak wasn't even there. Right? So we have from like that extreme where the guy who's the Beshert is not actually at the well. And then you have in the middle, you have, yes, Yaakov is at the well. Uh, he sees Rachel. And, and then here we have Moshe at the well and Sipora and her six sisters at the well. And he's not only present, but he's really active, right? So what, what does he do? He's like Superman, right? You even read it in a different intonation, Risa. You said something that, what did he say? He rose to their defense, right? <laughs> <laughs> here he comes to save the day. Yeah, he really is like definitely doing that. Uh, and so it kind of foreshadows what Moshe's role is going to be, not only in Sipora's life perhaps, but in the larger sense in, in Jewish history. Now, um, we are, uh, the thing at the end here, the part at the end that Risa read, she bore a son whom he named Gershom, for he said, I've been a stranger in a foreign land. That also seems to foreshadow the idea of B'nai Israel leaving Egypt there, and that when we're told as descendants of the Israelite slaves to remember, Ki gerim mitzrayim, you were strangers in the land of Egypt, so you too should be sympathetic to the plight of the stranger. We get that in uh, Moshe's calling his son Gershom. But now we're going to have another story of Zipporah, starting with verse 23. I'll start reading it just because it goes across two pages, and then we'll... Uh, uh, I'll skip. Yeah, I'm going to skip ahead. I'm going to skip ahead to Exodus chapter 4, verse 19. And to minimize nausea here, I will scroll out. Uh, incidentally, while I'm scrolling, uh, what was the name of Tsipara's father? Reuel. Yeah, and does anyone know of it? Yeah, I was wondering about that. Yeah. What's that all about? Right, so Reuel and Yitro are the same person, and the rabbis are all confused about why there are all these different names here. I can't say that they're confused. They try to resolve our potential confusion with this. Their Yitro seems to be referred to in very in different places in the Torah as sometimes Yitro, sometimes Reuel, sometimes Yeter, sometimes Chovav, uh, and 
it's not really uh, we're not clear which is his actual name meaning his birth name and which are nicknames uh, the word Yitro and Yeter may come from the word Yoter, which means more, like uh, Yoter Mikulam, more than everybody else. That could be, maybe that was a nickname given to him because he was the priest of Midian. He had some kind of higher level position, so he was Yoter. So maybe it was like his excellency, kind of some version of his excellency, not sure. Uh, but Ruel does refer to Yitro. So uh, let uh, so they were talking about Sipar being Yitro's daughter, Ruel's daughter, Hovav's daughter all the same guy and let me share the screen again okay so start reading from verse 19 uh, who would like to read Susie uh, you need to unmute there you go Yeah, Yahuwah said to Moses in Midian, go back to Egypt for all the authorities who sought to kill you are dead. So Moses took his wife and sons, mounted them on an ass and went back to the land of Egypt. And Moses took the rod of God with him. And Yahuwah said to Moses, when you return to Egypt, see that you perform before Pharaoh all the marvels that I've put within your power. I, however, will stiffen his heart so that he will not let the people go. Then you shall say to Pharaoh, thus says Yahuwah, Israel is my firstborn son. I have said to you, let my sons go that he may worship me. Yet you refuse to let him go. Now I will slay your firstborn son. Okay, so stop there, Susie. There's one word that appears over and over again in this little excerpt, the word son and sons. Right. If you look in verse 20, it says that Moses took his wife and sons. Okay, We don't know the name of the other son yet because it's not yet mentioned in the Torah, uh, but there is there were two sons, Gershom and Eliezer. And here it seems like when Moshe left, he had he took not only the son whose name we were told earlier in the Parsha in uh, Gershom, connected to the word ger, stranger, uh, but he had another son. And then if you look in verse 22, there's all this mention about Bini. So you have verse 22, it says, Ko Amar Hashem Bini Bechori Yisrael. Israel's my firstborn son. Then in verse 23, Bini. Uh, and then the end of verse 23, Bincha, Bechorecha. So we have not only the mention of son, but we also have the mention of Bechor, Elzis' son, because that may foreshadow the 10th plague, the, take of, the plague of the firstborn, the plague of the slaying of the firstborn Egyptians. So these are all important things to note. The other phrase that's important to note is up here in verse 19, the authorities who sought to kill you are dead. This whole idea of someone seeking to kill you is about to meet us when we meet Sipora in chapter 4 of the book of Exodus. Starting here, and I'll read this part. At a night encampment on the way, Hashem encountered him and sought to kill him. So Sipora took a flint and cut off her son's foreskin. Okay, before I look at the rest of the verse on the next page, let's just see a couple of things on this page. First, we have this, the seeking to kill. Vayivakesh hamito is hearkening back to here. Mivakshim et nafshecha, seeking to, to kill you. Slightly different words in the Hebrew, but this whole idea of wanting you dead. Uh, but here in verse 24, it says, sought to kill him. There are differences of opinion in the commentaries about whether kill him was kill the son or kill Moshe. Could have been either. I wanted to know what you thought just before I even go to the next page, uh, the next verse, the continuation of verse 25. What do you think is happening here and why is God seeking to kill him, whoever the him is? Anyone have any guesses? So there's not really a right or wrong answer for this for the him because the pronoun is indeterminate. If I may, that Moses had not performed the Brit Mila on the sun? Yeah, that could be. I mean, that's that seems like a who's talking because I hear a voice, but I don't see a Rini. face. Oh, um, Rini. Hi, I see your name, but I don't see your face. Okay, Rini. So mm -hmm. Rini, yeah, it could be this. In fact, uh, there is a midrash in the Mechilta 
that does say that Yitro let Sipora marry Moshe on the condition that they not circumcise Gershon. <clears throat> so that even though, yes, he might be raised as what we would call today a Jew, he would not be circumcised. So he'd still have a foot in the Midianite camp. And Tzipora now, according to this Midrash, realizes that the Brit is, Brit Milah is an essential sign of the Brit, of the covenant between God and the Jewish people. And maybe she thinks at some level that Moshe has to be a role model, a spiritual exemplar. The Midrash doesn't say that, I'm adding that. But the Midrash is saying that Tzipora took it into her own hands, literally, to circumcise the son. And it could be even, and this is a different Midrash, that says that when this verse 24 at the night encampments and Hashem encountered and sought to kill him. Not sure exactly what Hashem did that looked like he was seeking to kill him, whether the hymn was Moshe or the hymn was Gershom. But Sipara took it in her own hand to say, oh, maybe the reason why God is trying to kill him is because he's <clears throat> circumcised, as Rini said. And let me rectify that situation and let me circumcise him. And by the way, I'm not going back on my word to my father because I'm not the one who gave the word to my father. It was Moshe who gave the word to my father not to circumcise. So here I'm going to do it. Uh, one other comment I wanted to make here before going continuing the verse on the next page. At a night encampment on the way, Vayehi Vaderech Bamalon. So Vaderech, where was he going? Um, he was going here back in verse 18, it said, uh, sorry, in verse 19, where God says to Moshe to go back to Egypt because the, kind of the coast is clear, all, all those who want to kill you are, are dead. Um, so we know that he's on the way leaving Midian to go back to Egypt. Uh, but this idea of something happening at night. Uh, now, it's interesting because in the Hebrew, it doesn't actually say Laila, it just says Baderach Bamalon. Malon is the Hebrew word for hotel. But hotel usually indicates that you're going to be sleeping over someplace. So the translators of this uh, version of the Humash from the WRJ, they had an encampment. Does anyone have other translations in, for this Vayihi Baderach Bamalon? And it came to pass on the way at the lodging place. Right, so it doesn't say night, it just says on the way in the logic place. That's a more literal <laughs> translation. Uh, perhaps the reason why night encampment is used as a translation here is because it's most likely was at night that he was staying at a, that they were staying at a lodging place. Uh, it seems very similar to another biblical incident. So talk about type scenes. They may not be as numerous as the scene at the well type scene, but there's another incident of a biblical character who in, has an encounter at night that's uh, near fatal. Yes. Lisa. Uh, Jacob at um, fighting when his name was changed to Israel. So I heard I heard someone saying Abraham, someone saying Isaac. No, Yaakov. Yeah. Yeah. So Abraham certainly, I mean, he encountered quite a few near-death experiences during his journey, including when he went to Egypt and he ended up have, passing his wife off as his sister. So that was, it wasn't necessarily at night, but there was definitely the sense of you're on a journey, you're on the road, you're in danger. Yaakov, as Risa just explained, in his encounter before meeting Esau the next day, he has this encounter with a being, a man. Uh, was it a dream? Was it an angel? Was it Esau's angel? Was it uh, some other divine being? Whatever it was, he was wrestling. And as Risa said, his name changed from Yaakov to Yisrael. Yisrael, Israel actually means one who struggles with God. So there's this sense of a mysterious night incident and traveling from one place to the other. Jacob's encounter, his nighttime encounter with this being, uh, the night before his reunion with his brother Asab is fraught with uncertainty and anxiety, as we can imagine Moshe must be feeling this as well. He's no longer in a safe place in Midian. He's now going back to Egypt, which is the place where he killed the taskmaster, where he ran for his life, and where now he is on a mission to really go... Uh, put his own life in danger again, because he's gonna be the guy who is the spokesperson for God, who speaks to, e to Pharaoh in Egypt and says, shalach anami, let my people go. So you can imagine that the feelings in Moshe's heart and the thoughts in his head might be very similar to the thoughts and feelings experienced by Yaakov when he was at the river the night before he was about to meet Asaph. Um, so now, um, yes, somebody else wanna say something? Please, could you please remind me when was the original covenant of cutting the foreskin or doing the circumstance made? 
Okay, so the very first time we see it in Parshat Lech Lecha, this is during Avraham's journey. Uh, he already has journeyed to the land of Canaan. It's after he has escaped the near-death experience in Egypt um, and another place uh, with another king. Uh, no, that's Yitzchak, sorry, uh, just once with Aram. Um, and it's at the end of Parshat Lech Lecha where God issues the command to Avraham's descendants that on the eighth day there should be a brit, uh, brit mila, brit, not, how should I say? we call it a brit, a bris, but it's really brit mila, the covenant ceremony of circumcision. And on that day when God says it, there weren't eight day old boys who just happened to be eight days old who were circumcised that day. It was ya, uh, Avraham at age 99. It was Yishmael, Avraham's uh, ha, his, his son by Hagar, the half brother of Yitzchak. Uh, he has, um, he has his circumcision and um, there it, it's commanded that there will be on the eighth day in, in future times that, that a boy should be circumcised on the eighth day. So does that answer your question, Betty Ann? Okay, all right, let's go back to Tzipora. So we're in verse 25, the first part I read, Vatikach Tzipora Tzor Vatichrot Et Or Lat Bina Vataga Liragla Vatomer Ki Chatanda Mi Matali now someone read it in English, what I just read in Hebrew. Okay, I'll go back. Wait, now I'm getting nauseous again. Where is it? There it is. So Tsipara took a flint and cut off her son's foreskin and touched his legs with it, saying, would someone like to read up here the second part of verse 25, what Tsipara says? Myrna, go ahead. You are truly a bridegroom of blood to me. And when God let him alone, she added a bridegroom of blood because of the circumcision. Okay, this is a very strange comment. A bridegroom of blood. Chatan, that's the word we use for a groom. What is she, touch, is she touching the foreskin at the baby's leg? or um, It says, well, it says she touched his legs. Um, it's, it seems like she's talking about the son because that's what the antecedent is. But again, it's ambiguous because of the pronoun. Because she said she cut off Orlat Bina, she cut off the foreskin of her son, and then she touched his legs with it. Yeah, it sounds like it's probably it's probably Gershom. And so who is she calling a Chatan Damim? She, uh, she's probably referring to Moshe because he's the groom, but maybe she's referring to Gershom. What do you all make of this of this comment? It's and of this action of the blood of it's, the... it's really uh, a relation to a woman as well because it's, it's the same thing with it with the genitalia of the woman as the, as the, in this case with the with the male figure oh i see what you're saying blood like like menstruation blood yes yeah yeah okay interesting okay so uh, right, you, you think usually it's the bride who has blood, but now this is the a br the bridegroom who has blood. Uh, anything else you think uh, with why she mentions blood? What's what's the? No, part? I wasn't talking. Excuse me, I wasn't talking about menstruation. Oh, I was talking okay. about he mentions a bridegroom of blood. Mm -hmm. I'm talking about a virgin. Ah, uh, on the a night virgin of the day. blood yeah. upon the first time or whatever of sex. Uh, okay, so how, what do you make of that connection? I'm wondering about the connection. I don't know, but it, to me, when he says bridegroom, it immediately brought you to the bride. And the same thing. Uh, interesting, okay. There's, a, a, there's a, a penetration of a body in some form or fashion, and it has to do with a, a singular event, bridegroom. Ah, okay. Interesting, and I'm wondering if you looked at it in that way, uh, perhaps what Sipora is saying is, you've already made me bleed once, like on our wedding night, because I was a virgin and you penetrated me and there was blood, and now again, there's blood. Like every time you're around, there's blood. Uh, she's adding it. She's saying this, a female is saying this. Right, she's, she's saying it, but even though she's the one who performed the circumcision, yes, doing it because Moshe did not do it, right? Moshe was supposed to circumcise his own son. In fact, you know, halachically, a father is supposed to circumcise his son and only appoints a moyo to, to do that, but it's supposed okay. to be a father. Um, any other comments about this strange phrase before we well, move on? Um, you mentioned earlier about foreshadowing when all the 
sons were repeated. And perhaps this is foreshadowing blood on the doorposts when the Israelites leave Egypt. Very nice. Okay, so let's, um, it, the idea of the blood could be hearkening back to blood that Sipara herself experienced. That was Betty Ann's idea. But it also could be foreshadowing the 10th plague, slaying of the firstborn. What did the Israelite have to do? What did they have to put on their doorposts? They had blood, right? And the blood from the lambs, that was a way of identifying those homes as the homes of Hebrew slaves so that the destroyer, the angel of death would march, march, pass over the these doorways. And that's where we get the name of the holiday, Passover. So it could be looking ahead to that. It could be looking ahead even before that, the first plague, the first plague was dumb. Right. Mm -hmm. So we could have both the looking back, as Betty Ann suggested, and also this looking forward. Um, who said, is this Rini again? Yes. Yes, because I, I don't have everybody on the screen. Okay. Uh, so we have that that really nice literary structure there. There's uh, Martin Buber wrote the following thing about this incident, um, this following commentary. He wrote, an event of the night typically happens to religious leaders as a psychological reaction to their newly won certainty an intuition that the task that they have taken on God's behalf will be even more difficult than they thought. So that is, you know, the idea of Moshe's uncertainty. And yet in the midst of this anxiety and uncertainty, he forgets to do the most important thing, which was give a, cir a circumcise his son. And it's Sipara who ends up doing this. Uh, Rabbi? Yes. Rabbi? Yes, um, do we know whether um, Moshe was circumcised? Because if he was, mm -hmm. then that would identify him as a Hebrew. And I just wonder how he could have lived in the um, Pharaoh's palace uh, all this time uh, without anybody noticing. That, that is an excellent was, question. The kid was circumcised. Excellent question. In fact, if you recall uh, from the movie, The Ten Commandments, the way it's portrayed in the movie is how did they know the Bat Paro, who I think they call her Bitya or Bat Batya is what the Midrash calls her. How does she know this is a Jewish boy? By the blanket, right? There's a little blanket that's like only something that the Hebrew slaves had. That's was a very nice device for the movie. We don't get any of that information in the written Torah. And yes, if he had a circumcision, why do you need a blanket? <laughs> so most likely he was not circumcised. Who knows, was he circumcised later? Uh, if he was, the Torah certainly doesn't tell us about it. And if he was circumcised later, it would have been a way more painful procedure. It would have been more akin to what Avraham experienced when he had his first Brit Mila back there in Parshat Lech Lechab. That's an excellent question. Um, what are your thoughts? Do we think Moshe was circumcised or not? I don't know. It could be a final Jeopardy question. <laughs> Isn't there a midrash also that he was born circ already circumcised? Yes, there is a midrash that he was born circumcised. Uh, also, that like King David was born circumcised. Uh, <laughs> so you know, I know we know what Alice thinks about midrash, but uh, <laughs> or at least about this one. So yeah, they're all kind of. But you know, let's say he was born circumcised. It's called a mahul, someone who already had the circumcision, mm -hmm. didn't need a mile to do it. Uh, wouldn't that have been a dead giveaway that he was a Jewish boy? Because no one would say, oh, he must have been born circumcised. They'd assume that the someone did the circumcision to him. So my guess is, at least in his early years, when he, when he was a baby and found in the Nile River, he most likely was not circumcised then because that would have been a dead giveaway. Uh, although I could be wrong. Maybe Bafaro saw the circumcision and Dafka, that's why she wanted to take care of him because she knew his life was in danger. Carol, mm -hmm. you wanted to say something? I mean, anytime you. Sorry. Um, that, that last paragraph is really very confusing, but in, um, in circumcising Gershon, she was actually converting him. Um, until that point, he wasn't actually um, a member of, of, of Moses' tribe. And um, so the, uh, the bridegroom of blood was initiation, actually. Now he's fully a part of, of Moses and his people. Yeah, and it, and it's and that seems to be something that maybe Yitro was trying to avoid when he asked Moshe to promise me not to circumcise my son, uh, my grandson, uh, and but now Tzipora decides to do it. 
So uh, it, it could be that she, look, she, she, she was making a conscious decision to bring him into the covenants of the Jewish people. Was she doing this out of fear because something happened protection. on the road, right? Or, mm -hmm. you know, or protection, right? We're not mm -hmm. really sure what happened. That verse, I kind of glossed over it, where it says God sought to kill him. And we weren't sure if the him is Gershom or the him is Moshe. What exactly happened on the way? Whatever it was, Sipora saw it, noticed it. And it was immediately afterwards that she decided to do the circumcision. So maybe her thought was, this child needs to be protected. And there is a, a danger. There's a, a, a imminent danger right now. Okay, so I'm going to end this section, this chapter, uh, with a poem. Uh, and then show you another text about Sipora and end with another poem. It's always hard to try to fill everything into one session, but we'll try to do the best we can. So this is from this same commentary, the WRJ commentary. It's a poem by Shirley Kaufman. And she, she labels it, she entitles it, The Wife of Moses. She doesn't actually use Sipora's name. Uh, Betty Ann, would you like to read it? Something went wrong when he told her to pack and went on listening to voices she couldn't hear. It wasn't her job, this blood on her fingers, this cut flesh, red love bites in the sand. The desert widens between them like an endless argument. His mouth is too soft for God's omniferous rage. Fish will die. The rivers stink in lice and flies and boils and the rest. Slice the covenant, blood on the doors. He's off to his mountain. She'll lose what she saves. Fall out of the future thankless, nothing to lean on but her own arms. Holding the small face unfathered away, anyway, crying between her hands. Okay. Unfathered. Yes. Yeah, so what do we make of this unfathered piece? Okay. He had a father. No. Who was the father? Risa? I okay. always think of him as fatherless. <laughs> I mean, he went off to Egypt and basically left his family behind. And we find that before the Ten Commandments, when Yitro comes with his, with Moses' wife and his two sons, and it's like they haven't seen each other in years and years. Okay, so if we're thinking about the unfathered clause in this, uh, in this poem referring to Moshe, Moshe had a father, right? His name was Amram. He was married to Yocheved, but there was no contact between father and son, so it was if he was fatherless. But it also in the poem could be referring to the baby boy, to Gershom, that here is Sipora left with this little boy and she's holding the small face, unfathered anyway, crying between her hands. Maybe she's holding the son. He has a father. Who's the father of Gershom? Moshe. So why is he fatherless? Well, maybe if we look at the next part of the Humash where Sipora is mentioned, we have a, perhaps an answer to this. Okay, so here's that part again, holding the small face unfathered anyway, crying between her hands. Right, you call someone unfathered if the father is not present. And we're gonna see not only a hint of this, but real indication of this. This is in Parshat Yitro. We're still in the book of Exodus chapter 18. And uh, we have here, here he's called Yitro, Reuel, same guy, father-in-law. Jethro, priest of Midian, Moses' father-in-law heard all that God had done for Moshe and for Israel, God's people, how Hashem had brought Israel out from Egypt. So Jethro, Moses' father-in-law, took Zipporah, Moses' wife, after she had been sent home. And her two sons, of whom one was named Gershom, we've met him already, that is to say, I have been a stranger in a foreign land, and the other was named Eliezer, meaning my ancestor's God was my help, delivering me from the sword of Pharaoh. Right, so going back to here, what is this business here about yet Jethro, Moshe's father-in-law, taking Sipora's wife after Mo, Sipora, comma Moshe's wife after she had been sent home? Wait, where was Sipora all this time? Wasn't it Yitro who had left? What is going on here? So one rabbinic explanation here is that when Yitro left, at some point, either right then or shortly thereafter, he called upon Sipora and kids to come back to him. So although, uh, raise your hand if you've seen the film Prince of Egypt, the movie, the cartoon, animated. Okay, in Prince of Egypt, Sipora plays a really prominent role. Not so much in the Cecil B. DeMille version, right? Uh, so, and not in the Torah version either. Here, Sipora seems to be with her father again. 
and the grandchildren seem to be with Yitro. So there is some point where there is some leaving going on. Uh, I'm going to turn to, blah, 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 um, find it. Yes, on the next page. Here, this, uh, on this commentary. The narration implies that Moses' wife and children were living in Midian while Moses returned to Egypt to free the Israelites. Yet no notice was given earlier that Zipporah and her sons were dispatched back to Midian. When last we encountered Zipporah, she was traveling with Moses and her sons from Midian to Egypt. On the way, she saved her family by circumcising her son. The mysterious Chatan Damim, the bridegroom of blood incident back in chapter four. So this business here sent home, the Hebrew verb here can mean divorce. So some interpreters claim that Moses had divorced her. Yet, well, this is the WRJ comment said, this explanation is not persuasive since Jethro refers to her as Moshe's wife in verse six here. The reason for the separation is not explained. So it's not really clear. Um, does anybody have a comment? Like, where do you think Zipporah was during this time? Do we think that Moshe divorced her? Or do we think that he just sent her back home at some point? He might have sent her back home for safety because he was doing something quite dangerous by um, confronting Pharaoh and actually threatening Pharaoh with all kinds of things. Um, so I, it's possible that he just sent her back for, uh, for her own safety and the safety of his sons. Yes, right. We just, the Torah doesn't tell us that, but it seems possible, right? Um, another, uh, let me show you this is also on the same episode. Okay, so I'm back in, um, still in Parsha Yitram in chapter 18, but now what I'm looking at is verse 7, where it says here, Moses went out to meet his father-in-law. He bowed low and kissed him. Each asked after the other's welfare, and they wept into the tent. So this is a continuation of the biblical passage I was reading earlier. And if we say that Zipporah was sent back or divorced, whatever it was, but she's with her dad and she's with her kids in Midian, why is it that Moshe is going out to greet his father-in-law and not his wife that he hasn't seen for a while, or his kids for that matter? And there's a commentary here. He bowed low and kissed him. Okay, would someone like to read this commentary that's on the screen? Alice, do you want to read? Um, <clears throat> he bowed low and kissed him. Moses, acting uh, as the host, warmly greets his father-in-law. But no mention is made of him welcoming his wife and sons. This imbalance may reflect the formal hospitality cust customs common in the in the biblical world, or rather than suggesting, or rather than suggesting the neg the neglect of his family, this may stem for the from the Torah's intent to highlight Moses' remarkable relations with his Midianite father-in-law. Okay. Hmm. All right. Yeah. 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 Could be, yeah. right? A little skeptical, but um, anyone have comments on this before I uh, share the last biblical and midrashic excerpts about Sipora? Yes, Elaine. I was thinking that, you know, um, going back to the, the view of women, well, that was his wife, but, you know, stay in the kitchen and, you know, don't bother us. And where, where does my uh, support come or where? where uh, am I going to, you know, really get my wealth or whatever, maybe from the father-in-law rather than, you know, the wife is, she's an accessory, you know, she's, she's there to do what she has to do, but not that important. Interesting. Okay. Yeah, not, not very inspiring to us as women, but we can't be, uh, we can't be anachronistic. I mean, we can't help but be anachronistic, but <clears throat> are imposing our values on, on that society. Uh, let me share with you another commentary. Yes, go ahead. Couldn't it also be that the emphasis, not so much that she wasn't important, but Yitra was important in the continuation of the story because he's going to give all the recommendations for judgments and, you know. Yeah, yeah, it could be that he I did. Mean, he had further information to give, so the emphasis was on him, and it's normal that you would expect, it didn't do anything for the storyline to have him greet his wife and children. He most likely right. did well, that anyway. Right. It could be the same thing. Like people often ask me, what is it with all of these biblical characters? They didn't have any daughters. They only had sons. It's possible they had daughters, but they're not mentioned because they're not considered key to the storyline. So it could be a similar thing here, right? Like, yes, the wife was there. Yes, the kids were there, but the focus is on Yitro. Yeah. Thank you for that. 
Uh, okay, a few more texts. So this is another commentary, also from the WRJ commentary on chapter 18, verse 2. This is from Parshat Yitro. This uh, verse, this is the biblical verse. So Jethro took Zipporah after she had been sent home. The biblical text gives no information on when or why Moses sent Zipporah and her sons back to Jethro. A tradition in Mechilta Amalek 3 imagines that after Moses received the divine call to redeem Israel from slavery, he set out for Egypt with his family. When he encountered Aaron on the way, in chapter 4, verse 27, Moses introduced his wife and sons, and Aaron responded, We are worrying about those already there, and now you bring upon us these newcomers? At that moment, Moses said to Zipporah, Go to your father's house. Based on the use of the verb sent, shalach, both here and in the description of divorce in the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 24, verse 1, the rabbis concluded that Moses divorced his wife, though they debated whether he did so with a get, a bill of divorce, or simply by an oral statement. Okay, so there we have, uh, in that midrash, we have uh, Aaron playing a role in the in sending Yocheved home, uh, in sending Moshe home, sorry, in sending Sipara back to Midian, uh, whereas others of you have suggested that maybe she was sent home for safety reasons, and maybe it was uh, Sipara who herself wanted to go because of safety reasons, or Yitro wanted her back and called for her back, or Moshe sent her back. Okay, last biblical text here, and leading to our last midrash and poem. Okay, so here I'm um, in now the book of Numbers, chapter 12, the book of Amidbar. We're not going to read the whole excerpt because of time, but this is the very famous episode, or famous to some of us, of Lashon Hara, of gossip, of talking, saying bad things about someone behind their back talking about someone behind their back. And here we have, Vatizaber Miriam v'aharon b'moshe alodot ha'isha ha'kushit asher lakach, ki isha hushit lakach. Okay, will someone read this in, in the English? Starting with Miriam. Ruth, do you want to read it? Chapter 12, verse 1 of, of Numbers. Uh, my Chapter 12, verse 1 of Numbers. Okay. Uh, when they were in, oh, Miriam and Aaron spoke against Moses because of the Cushite woman he had married. He married a Cushite woman. Okay, stop right there. Uh, the rest of that story uh, is Miriam ends up getting punished. Uh, and there's questions, was Aaron punished as well? But then there are Midrashim that say, well, she initiated the gossip. But it's not really quite clear what it was they were talking about. Like, yes, it's clear because he married a Cushite woman. What does that mean? How was that Lashon Hara? So what are some of your understandings of what about that was wrong? What was Mir what were Miriam and Aaron talking about? Who was the Kushite woman? And what does this have to do with our wild woman of the month? Risa? Well, just the fact that she wasn't one of them, perhaps. <clears throat> that she was of a different nationality, person type of thing altogether. There's also some thought, if I recall, that Kushite was black and that it was white versus black. And I don't know if that's really true because I don't know what Yeah, that is what everybody else had. Yeah, I mean, there is, right, who knows how, how, what color skin everyone else had exactly. Uh, Kush is oftentimes uh, associated with Ethiopia. Uh, in the book in Megillat Esther, which we're about to read next week, it says that Ahasuerus was the king of 100, I forget how many, 127 provinces, Mehodu Va'ad Kush, from uh, India to Ethiopia, from Turkey to Ethiopia, and that Ethiopia is Kushite, and that it was a derogatory comment. In fact, in the WRJ commentary, the very uh, headline here, it says, criticizing Moses, Miriam, Aaron, and the Kushite woman. It's understood from the punishment that happens. Miriam gets stricken with leprosy or with sara'at, a leprous type of skin disease. And here in this commentary, it says, uh, the presence of two female characters stands out in the story. One, Miriam is active and central. She constitutes the story's axis. The other, Moshe's unnamed wife called the dark-skinned or Kushite woman is unseen and silent, though from her behind the scenes position, she is the story's catalyst. And then right here, there is this commentary about the Kushite woman. What is Miriam and Aaron's complaint against their brother and his marriage? Are they attacking Moses for marrying a woman with dark skin? Is it a diatribe against marriage outside of the Israelite tribal structure? 
So there is that connection, and many people do read this, and I know of many uh, sermons and writings on this Parsha, Parsha Pahalotcha, that do try to look at this story as a story of potential racism or dealing with people of different races. And then there are others, there are other commentaries that say that that's not the case, that Kushite woman is actually not about anything about race or the color of her skin, that uh, Kushite, in fact, could even be a compliment. Uh, let me see if I can find it here. Um, yes, it could mean beautiful. It could mean, um, let's see, that it's not a diatribe against marriage outside of the Israelite tribal structure, that it's really just mentioning how beautiful she was. And um, in other places in the Tanakh, in the book of Amos, Kushites are presented as equal to Israelites in God's view. Um, in any event, the, mo the most common commentary on this story in Numbers is that Miriam and Aaron were saying bad stuff about the Kushite woman. But let me suggest something else, and some of you may have heard me teach this before, and this is what I'm going to end with this in a poem. Uh, there are Midrashim that look at this text and say that Miriam and Aaron were, they were talking about the Kushite woman, and that was a term that they used for Tzipora, that the Kushite woman and Tzipora were one and the same, but that they were actually uh, defending Tzipora, that they were saying nice things about her. Uh, and so I should say, though, just um, as an aside, there are other, yet other sets of commentators who say that the Kushite woman was a different person than Sipora, but more, more commentators than not say it's the same person. The Kushite woman was Sipora. In any event, there is a midrash here called Otsar Midrashim, and this is how they understand how this midrash understands what the gossip was about. Yes, it was gossip, but this is what it was about. It was actually something nice about Sipora or, or empathy with Sipora. And so too do we find with Aaron and Moses who gossiped about Moses. And therefore punishment came upon them, as it is said, and Miriam and Aaron spoke of Moses. Sipora went and spoke with Miriam. She, Sipora, said to her, her sister-in-law, Miriam, um, when the Holy Spirit of God alighted upon Eldad and Medad, everyone was happy. Miriam said, fortunate are the sons of these and fortunate are their wives. Okay, Eldad and Medad were uh, prophets and there was this prophecy experience that's described earlier in the book. And Sipara then says to Miriam, fortunate are their sons, but woe to their wives. So Miriam says to Sipara, why? And Sipara says back to Miriam, from the day that your brother became a prophet, I was no longer as a wife to him, meaning he no longer was intimate with me. So Miriam went and spoke to Aaron, and the two of them spoke words of complaint about the righteous one, Moses. And um, I'm going to skip that and show you another midrash that's similar in the Sifre. Miriam and Aaron spoke against Moses, the Vatezaber Miriam Vaharom Moshe. How did Miriam know that Moshe separated from the mitzvah of pru or vu, fertility? For she saw that Sipora was no longer adorning herself with women's jewelry. She, Miriam, said to her, Tzipora, why aren't you adorning yourself with women's jewelry? And she, Tzipora, said to her, your brother is no longer being strict about the matter, meaning He's not being strict about observing this mitzvah of pru or vu, of being fruitful and multiplying, meaning he's not having sex with me. So thus, Miriam knew that Moshe was no longer being intimate with his wife, and she told her brother Aaron, and the two, Aaron and Miriam, spoke about Moses. And we'll just leave that. Okay, so what do you think about that? <laughs> Whether, Mir you know, it's possible that Miriam and Aaron were saying good stuff about Sipora, bad stuff about Sipora, but in any event, we feel for Sipora, right? Uh, right? Like, she, whether she's the victim of a racist comment or the victim of just bad lang, you know, anti in laws saying not nice things about her that had nothing to do with her race, uh, or is it they're defending her, but yet she's the poor woman who is whose husband doesn't want to have sex with her anymore? All of these are not such great stories. Uh, go ahead, Elaine. Yeah, I'm thinking maybe it has nothing to do with the race, that she's a Kushite woman, but they just didn't like her. Yeah, it could be like a typical, not typical, but uh, sometimes found in-law situation, right? In all of these cases, though, we're not feeling like I wouldn't want to beat Sipora in any of these situations, right? Uh, and we definitely would get the sense, and maybe not only from these Midrashim, but even from the part that I just read, we read earlier, about how Yitro was with 
Sipara and the grandchildren that she was separated, even if it wasn't a matter of he's not having sex with her, he <clears> physically <throat> wasn't with her. There's this period of separation. So we definitely feel for her and we get the sense that once he was became prophet, he no longer was spending time with his family. I mean, he had a pretty big role. Like he, his, his job was all consuming, one could say, his mission to let my, let the people go with God. Uh, let's end with a poem. Uh, I don't know. Uh, yeah. Um, after, uh, after. Uh, was, okay, I'm sorry. Did go you ahead, pull Alice. on me, Rabbi? Yes, go ahead, Alice. Oh, okay. Um, was um, Tzipora considered part of, um, was she, was she kosher for him for Moses to marry? I mean, wasn't she outside the pale of uh, of um, the tribe of Israel? Yes, she, I mean, def what, yes, she definitely what was, was not. Yet, uh, what yes. was Jethro uh, Jethro a priest yes. of? What yes. kind of religion? Right, and which is actually going back to the Kush. I think if Kush is Ethiopia and she's from Midian, why is she being referred to as a Kushite? But whether she's a Kushite, an Ethiopian, or a Midianite, she's definitely not an Israelite. So right. we assume that there is an implied conversion here, the same way when we read about Ruth the Moabite, right? Ruth marries Boaz and she's a Moabite. But yet when we read the story of Ruth through the rabbinic eyes, we view her as, yes, Ruth the Moabite, but Ruth who converted to Judaism. In fact, the quintessential convert. And maybe that is something that we're getting a sense of here. There are commentaries on Yitro, by the way, that he converted that when he heard all of the signs and wonders that God performed in Egypt, that he himself converted that. Uh, so not only was he no longer, not he, he was not a priest of Midian, he was actually an Israelite himself, a, an Israelite by choice, a Jew by choice. And that would perhaps Zipporah and his other daughters did the conversion as well. But uh, good point. Uh, whatever it was, she was an outsider. And however we read this last excerpt, uh, biblical excerpt with Midrashic commentaries about Zipporah, she just, I get a sense of someone who feels alone or abandoned or lonely. Uh, and I'm gonna end with this um, poem, which you may not agree or with this perspective, but it's written by Barbara D. Hollander, <laughs> spelled differently and not uh, related to our Barbara Levy Hollander from Temple Beth Am. Uh, would someone like to end our session by reading this poem? <clears throat> Go oh, read. Go ahead, Elaine. I know I'll never get that house he promised me. We've had an option on the property for years. You'd think it was a million miles away. We could have been there already. But first, he won't take the responsibility, and then he drags along the whole mishpacha. I can't reach him. His head's in the clouds. Moses, I tell him, a promise is a promise. And he says, it's a firm commitment. Have a little faith but nothing keeps happening and happening and happening. Okay. <laughs> All right. What else is there to say? Uh, does anyone want to have the last word? 